Uh, during the last several weeks, we've been doing a study on church membership. And last week, part of that, for part of that study, we looked at the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 5 through 11. And as we looked at that text, we did so um, through the lens of understanding that life in Christ's church is not merely confined to the corporate gathering. Instead, in addition to being committed to the gathering of the saints, we saw that being a healthy church member means that we are also to be woven into each other's lives in a meaningful way. And so, uh, last week, uh, we looked at Paul's teaching to this church and his call to them to put off the things that are associated with the old self, uh, specifically the sinning that we committed prior to coming to know the Lord. Verses 5-9 through nine commanded us, put these things off. And tonight, as we pick up the rest of this section, we're going to switch our focus away from what we're called to avoid as Christians, and instead, we're going to focus on what we're supposed to do as Christians. The, Christians li the Christian life is not just about not sinning. That's part of it. But it is also about proactively, intentionally doing other things. And so, we're going to look at the other side of the coin uh, here tonight. And so, as was the case last week, we're going to see that the actions that we're to take, according to this text, they are rooted in the theological saving realities of what God has done for us in Christ. And without realizing these, uh, uh, these saving realities we have in Christ, we're not going to have any life, we're not going to have any power, uh, and we will not have uh, what we need in our hearts and in our minds to do the things Paul commands us to do uh, in this text. So our text for tonight is Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. And as we anchor ourselves firmly in the love of God we will find that God will supply power to us and we will be able to live out the things that Paul tells us to do in Colossians 3, 12 through 17. And seeing as how this is a church membership series, I also want you to read this passage through the lens of thinking, how do these things apply in church membership? You will find that it is impossible to live out the things you're commanded to live out in this text as a Christian apart from meaningful membership in the local church. So let's go ahead and turn to Colossians chapter 3, um, beginning in verse 12. Paul says in verse 12, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Now, what I would like to begin—I'd like to begin uh, considering verse twelve by drawing our attention to the fact that Paul calls believers God's chosen ones. You see that there? Put on then as God's chosen ones. As believers, one of the most powerful yet controversial realities is that God chose us for salvation before you were ever born. Before you had done anything good or evil, God, sent his, God set His saving gaze on you. And because of His gracious and loving purposes, He chose you for salvation. You did not primarily choose Him. He chose you. The only reason you chose Him is because He first chose you. And so it is wonderful to me that Paul calling us to be a loving people here reminds us that we're God's chosen ones. What does it mean to be His chosen ones? Well, if we will turn quickly to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, Ephesians will give us a little bit more fleshing out of what Paul means here. Now, Ephesians is a letter that Paul wrote at the time, roughly around the same time he wrote Colossians. It is a fellow prison epistle, and there are strong parallels to what we see in Colossians. So, in Ephesians 1, verse 4 through 6, we'll see more about what it means to be chosen by God. So Ephesians 1, verse 4 through 6, I'm going to read the whole thing. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6, it tells us that through Jesus Christ, God the Father chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, 
with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. So this text here in Ephesians 1, it confirms that God chose us to be in Christ before the foundation of the world. He didn't choose you to be in Christ after you did something that He said, oh, good job, now I'll put you in Christ. Before He ever made the world or you or anyone else, He chose you to be in Christ. And this text, we see not only the fact that He chose us uh, before the foundation of the world, but verse 5 tells us one of the reasons why He chose us. What motivated God to choose believers to be in Christ? Verse 5 tells us, look closely, it says, in love. He chose us. So the motive behind God's choosing you for salvation is that He loves you. And if you and I are ever going to appreciate the love of God in our lives as we ought, it is critical for us to rejoice in the truth that before God ever created a believer, love motivated Him to choose specific believers for salvation. Had you not first been chosen by God, you would never choose Him. And when you look at this text and what it says about believers, and you sit there as a believer and you ask yourself, why did God choose me for salvation? The first reason we see here in the Word of God is that He chose us because He loves us. And this love here, this love that He has for believers, listen, it's a special love. It is not the same general love for all mankind that He has. This is a special electing love that specifically chose all those who are truly in Christ for salvation. God does love all mankind. It's totally too true. John 3.16 is talking about the whole world. He loves all mankind. But it is with a special electing love that He chooses His people before He ever made them. It's a unique love. It's not the same love He has for the unbeliever. He has a heightened love for believers. And if you're a believer today, you are a believer because God set a special saving love upon you and He chose you to be His adopted child. Here's an illustration for this. Let's say some adoptive parents go to an orphanage and there are thousands of orphans there. Or thousands may be a bad example because we're flying out. There's a hundred orphans there. And they spend a lot of time with all the orphans. And they love all the orphans that they see. However, the children they end up adopting, they can only take, say, five of them. Among the hundred of of orphans, there is going to be a special and unique kind of love placed upon the adoptive parents that's different than the general love for all the orphans that they have. So it is with God. Before He made you, He chose you for adoption as His child. And as He made you, He knit everything about you together in your mother's womb. Psalm 139. And He did so to create you in the exact way that you are. And he created, he created you exactly as you are as a believer so that one day in time and space through the power of the Holy Spirit and based on the saving work of Jesus, God would redeem you, recreate you, save you, and make you His adopted child for all eternity. He has predestined you for this because He loves you. That's the Word of God. It's a unique love for you. Now, the other reason why God predestined believers to be His children that we can see specifically in the text, we don't have to speculate about it or get philosophical about it, we can be exegetical about it. It's in Ephesians 1. Look again at the text. He says that He did this according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace with which He's blessed us in the Beloved. So, now we learn from the Word of God that not only did love motivate God in choosing us, but also uh, the perfect purpose of His will is part of why He chose us for salvation. It says it, because of the purpose of His will. 
God's will is so vast. It's so comprehensive. It's very complex. It is beyond us. And Paul tells us at the end of Romans 11 that it's far beyond us ever being able to fully grasp. God is simply too glorious of a being, too high of a, uh, of a being, and too grand of a being for finite sinners to ever fully know the extensive, exhausted purposes of His will. It's just not mathematically possible for the finite to fully comprehend the infinite. And so when we're dealing with a God like the God of the Bible, and He tells us that He predestined us to be adopted in Christ because of His love for us and because of the great purpose of His incredible will, rather than being offended by this, rather than grumbling against this, we ought to simply be filled with wonder that God chose us. And we should feel such a profound sense of blessing that it fills our hearts with it fills our hearts, it fills our minds with joy and with peace and with hope. You can't understand everything about God. You can't. And he chose some people for salvation. He did not choose everyone for salvation. And the ones he chose for salvation, he did so in love. That's what motivated him. And he did it according to this incredible complex will. And you're, you're part of that. So instead of getting mad, it should make you worship. Here's why. In all of the complexity, in all of the mystery, in all of the glory of the unsearchable will of God, it's wonderful to know that the formation of who you are, the choosing of you specifically before He made you, and the saving work of Christ that Christ achieved for you, it was all part of God's perfect, mysterious will. All that you are, all of the details of where you were born, who your family is, how you were brought up, what you've gone through, what led you to Christ, how you came to faith, where you are living out your faith, and what will transpire the rest of your days, it's all part of God's great loving will for your life. At the bottom of everything that's ever occurred in your life is the living God who orchestrates every detail Nothing is an accident. Nothing is a mistake because our sovereign God has good purposes for everything that takes place. I don't know about you guys, but I, I just find so much peace with that. So much security in that. It makes me feel super small in a wonderful way. God loves us. I can't figure everything out about that, but that's okay. God loves me. I can't believe that uh, I was chosen for salvation. Uh, for one, this is a side note. There is no such thing as luck. But for those of you who hold to that false teaching uh, and you say, I have the worst luck ever as a believer. Like, no, you don't. You were chosen for salvation. Now, you don't have bad luck. Luck doesn't even exist. But if you want to call it something luck that randomly happens to you, you don't have bad luck. You were chosen for salvation. It gets no better than that. And so, we see in Ephesians 1 that not only did God choose us because of His will, but the result of this is, it's, is that we are to praise His grace and understand that we are blessed in His beloved Son. Look at it again in verse 6. He did all this to the praise of His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. God did not choose you or me because He knew that we would choose Him. God did not choose us because He knew that we were righteous. That's not why God chose us. Colossians, we saw last week, Colossians 1.21 tells us prior to coming to God, we are hostile towards God and filled with nothing but evil deeds towards Him. Colossians 1 verse 13 and 14 tells us prior to our conversion, we're enslaved to the domain of darkness and our lives are full of sins that need God's forgiveness. Ephesians 2, 1 and 3 says prior to conversion, we're spiritually dead to God. We're steeped in sin. We're objects of His wrath and we follow Satan in the world in every way. So when God chose us for salvation, it was owing to absolutely nothing in us. Instead, when we realize God chose us for salvation, Ephesians 1.6 
tells us the right response is to praise His grace. In His love, in His complex will, He desired to show His people how incredibly gracious He is, and He does so through choosing us for salvation. Though we have rebelled, though we don't deserve God, though we only deserve hell, nevertheless, in our salvation, God demonstrates His free grace by choosing us. And so when you look at your life, when you look at your sins that are piled to the heavens, when you consider God's work in you, when you contemplate your salvation and your eternal destiny in Christ, the only right response is to praise His grace. Because of these truths, bragging has no place in the mouth of a Christian. God is gracious. God loves. God chooses. And He does it all according to His perfect will, which is beyond tiny man's ability to comprehend. In being so loved by God, in being freely chosen by His grace, in being adopted by His, uh, 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 in being adopted by Him in His Son Jesus Christ, Ephesians one six says, "You are blessed in the beloved. You are blessed." And so these truths here, these are some of the wonderful, glorious mysteries about our salvation. And if these things, if they don't move your heart to rejoice in God, then I would just say, ask God to open your eyes to them. It's okay if they don't, if if it's not moving you right now, that's part of Christian life. Ask God to move. Because, listen, you cannot possibly know the love of God for you the way you ought to unless you understand this truth. Unless you understand that He chose you by His free grace, not because of anything you did. He just chose you because He loves you according to His mysterious will. You can never know how much He loves you. And you want to know that. So don't fight the Bible's revelation of this. Worship God. And if you're struggling with it, it's okay. Ask God for help. I don't know about you guys, but I personally am extremely hard on myself every single day. Julie likes to use this uh, phrase to me. She says, sometimes you just like exasperate yourself. You will just not let yourself off the mat for whatever it is. You just beat yourself to a pulp. It's true. That's, that's a, a habit of mine. Uh, in, in some capacities, it can be good because you're always striving to press into the Lord. Uh, you know, you, We're content in God, but we're never satisfied. We want to press on more and more and more into God. I want to know how I can know Him more. I want to know how I can uh, be better at anything that I'm doing in, in, in service to God. Some of that is good. But some of it can become really bad. And so, at times when Satan twists my head and I'm particularly hard on myself, I can, I, I, I can see and I can taste and I can feel all of my sins. Sometimes all I can see are my deficiencies and my lack and I just, I just hate it. God, it's just so miserable. And I was going through some of that this week and what helped me this week was thinking about the fact that God knew every way in which I would sin as an unbeliever and as a believer. God knew all of my immaturities. He knew all of the ways I would misuse my gifts. He knew all of my selfishness. He knew all of my other sins. He knew uh, how my personality would express my sin. He knew all of my failures. He knew all of my shortcomings. And nevertheless, because He loves me with a unique love, because He's gracious to me, and because He wants me to know that I'm blessed in Christ, He still chose me for salvation. Why? So I can praise His grace. That's not only a true thing for me, it's also true for all of you who are in Christ. So when these kinds of things, this, this kind of graciousness in God, this kind of love in God, when it hits your heart as God intends for it to, then by the power of the Spirit, you're going to be enabled to love in the ways that our text in Colossians calls for. I think that's why Paul reminds us that we're chosen before he tells us to love. Now, returning to Colossians 3.12, let's look at another part of this verse. 
uh, in Colossians 3.12, we see that the other saving reality about believers that has spiritual power to enable us to live into the good things that are going to flow, at, flow through this text uh, is the reality that in Christ we are, look at the text, holy and beloved. What does it mean that we're holy and beloved? Are we holy because Christ paid for our sins? Or are we holy because of our conduct? I think the answer to, uh, to, to those questions is yes. Colossians has explicitly stated that we're made holy by the cross of Christ. And in our context, he's clearly telling us what not to do and what to do, which is holy conduct. So last week when we looked at Colossians 1, 21 through 23, it told us that we're enemies of God and that He put Christ to death for us to reconcile us to Himself as those who are now holy and blameless because of the cross. What this means is that Christ's death on the cross has so thoroughly removed the penalty of sin from us that when God looks at those who are in Christ, He sees us as those who have no more sin to be punished because Christ fully paid for it. And when Christ fully pays the bill for our sins, we are now, our standing with God is one that is declared by God to be holy. Your sins are removed because Christ paid for it. That is clearly in Paul's mind in the book of Colossians. He writes about it in chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. We are holy and beloved. Being given this holy position through the death of Christ shows us how we're beloved. We are loved of God because Christ made this sacrifice for us. He suffered for us. He was tortured to death for us. He took the wrath of God for us even though we didn't deserve it because He loves us. And in doing this, He made sinners holy before God. So that's one way that we're holy. But as I already mentioned, when, when Paul draws attention in verse 12 uh, to believers and identifies us as holy... Not only does Paul have in mind that we are holy in our position before God, we're also holy in our practice before God. Meaning, as people who are made new by Christ, as people who, according to Colossians 2, have had the circumcision of Christ done to our hearts, as people whose lives are hidden with Christ in God, Colossians 3, 1 through 4, we are also those who flee our sins, specifically what was laid out in verses 5 through 9 of chapter 3, and those who proactively seek to obey God uh, through the things that we will see in verses 12 through 17. So we are holy because Christ makes us holy by removing our sins. And we are also holy because by the Spirit, God causes us to live holy lives now. I think both of those things, uh, I, I don't think there's a need to choose between one or the other. What does Paul think? All right, I think it's obvious. He's already laid it out for us in the letter. And so, <clears throat> part of the reason changing us and causing us to turn from sin and obey God in a life of holiness, part of the reason that that's an expression of God's love to us is because leaving us to our sins, leaving us completely enslaved to sin, living a life of sin over and over and over again with no growth, with no change, that would be the most unloving thing possible. Sin destroys us in every way. And part of the love of God is to look at the sin that you're committing and call you to repent. Part of the love of God is to look at the things that He wants in your life and if it's not there, to exhort you to do those things. So, we are to be holy. Holy not simply positionally before God, but also in our conduct. So, those are, those are two things... Uh, to draw out in verse 12 prior to breaking down the specifics of what we're supposed to do. And so now that we've lingered a bit over the wonderful truths of how God has loved us in Christ, as, as we've seen the cross and His electing love as the power source for our holiness and for our love, we're going to spend the rest of our time now looking at the practical ways that we're to live out our new life in Christ. And I want to begin by drawing attention to the first three words of verse 12. First three words say, put on then.
The living out of the wonderful virtues Paul will describe in our passage requires that we put them on. Putting something on is a conscious and focused effort on our part. And in this context, putting on the things God calls for uh, in this text is rooted in our understanding of God's love for us. And sometimes the loving things that we're going to see in this text, the loving things that we're called to do, sometimes as believers, these things come easily due to us being in a good frame of mind that's enjoying God's love for us in Christ. Sometimes when we're close to God, it's easy to be compassionate. It's easy to be forgiving. It's easy to be humble and meek and kind. And it's a joy to have Christ's Word dwelling within us. And it's easy to sing with gratitude to God. Sometimes those things are easy. And all of God's saints, we know these wonderful and blessed seasons where God is so near and the Spirit is so powerfully upon us that there doesn't even really need to be any instruction about what we're supposed to do because the life force of God's Spirit within us just readily emits these things from us in a sweet way. I love those seasons. I'm sure you do too. Unfortunately... This is not the only experience that we have as believers. We are not constantly in a state of deep gratitude to God that expresses itself easily in many displays of spirit-filled love. Instead, sometimes we're very dull, we're dry, and we have these difficult seasons, and, and all we want to do is sin, and the things described in verses 12 through 17, they don't come naturally to us at all. In fact, there are times in the Christian life when the things that we're told to put off that were described in verses 5 through 9, they feel much easier for us to do than the things that were described, uh, the things that we're called to do in verses 12 through 17. The Bible calls these seasons temptation. We're in a war, as we talked about at the table. Satan's going to tempt us. The evil desires that remain in our flesh, they're going to be eager to comply. And if you think that the fruits that we're to produce in this life as believers are always going to be something that easily just flows from your union with Christ, if that's what you think, I want to love you with this and just say, listen, you're deceived. You're going to be ill-equipped and totally shaken when the difficult spiritual battles step right up into your face. It's not always going to be easy. That's why Paul said in Colossians 3.5 that we're pro to proactively kill sin. Put it to death. Does that sound easy? It's, it's not an easy thing. And then, so verse 12 tells us that we are to proactively put on the virtues God calls us to live into. So verses 5-9, through nine, it's put off. Kill in verses, in verses 12 through 17. Put these things on. And it requires a steady, resolved, focused, conscious effort to do these things. We have to be intentional in putting sins off and putting sins on. We have to choose to be kind and forgiving and patient and loving. And we choose this and fight for this and make sure we put it on even when we don't feel like it. And as we do this, as we're making the conscious, sometimes hard choice to put the virtues on that we're going to study tonight, we have to confess to God that our heart doesn't feel the way it's supposed to right now. And when we are in these moments where sometimes the hardest thing in the world is to just smile at the person driving you nuts, and we, we just smile by faith and say something nice to Him and our heart's wrong and all messed up, when that happens, we got to pray to God and ask Him to help our hearts. And guys, I, I can't tell you how many times uh, I have not felt like doing what God tells me to do. And as I pray my way through it and do it by faith, God so often meets you and He starts to align your heart and He aligns your feelings with the actions that you're choosing to do by faith in obedience to His Word. As I mentioned last time, that's not being fake. If you are a believer, the fake you 
is the you that doesn't want to obey God. The fake you is the arrogant you. The fake you is the unkind you, the unforgiving and bitter you, the resentful you, the petty you, the loveless you, and the you that wants nothing to do with your brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the fake you. And when you're in this season, and when the temptations fill you, you have to realize that living into these sins and giving into these temptations, that if you do that, that's when you're being fake, even if these temptations feel so real. You are not fake when by faith you preach God's love to yourself. When by faith you say, nah, my life is hidden with Christ in God. God made me for good works. You know what? He lays out in Colossians 3, 12 through 17 what these good works are. I'm going to think about these good works and I'm going to choose to put them on and I'm going to step out despite how I'm feeling and I'm going to do these good works towards somebody. God help me bring my heart and mind to rejoice in these things. That's being real, not fake. Because you're exercising faith in what God says you really are. You really are a new creation. You really are filled with the Spirit. You really are a child who loves. That's being real, not being fake. So to do the things we're going to now look at in the text, you have to be ready to put them on. So let's get practical now. Uh, Return to verse 12. The first two virtues, verse 12, tells us to put on our compassionate hearts and kindness. And as we interact with each other, we are to intentionally put on compassion. Compassion is an attitude and demeanor that has sympathy and sorrow for a difficult situation that someone is facing. In compassion, you show that you truly care about someone. In compassion, you show that their hurts and misfortune, that they're meaningful to you and that you're willing to emotionally invest in what they're going through. You're willing to emotionally dive into their pain and their difficulty and you're willing to be there for them. Compassion is not silent. Compassion is not aloof. Compassion is not cold. Instead, compassion is warm and it proactively reaches out to someone in a tough spot and it gladly and kindly enters into the pain for the purpose of showing love and being a help. It is extremely important for us to be compassionate people. Because if we have no compassion, our love is cold, we're clanging gongs, and we're hypocrites. And some of the strongest disappointments that people experience in the body are to go through something hard and difficult and then realize the people you thought would reach out to you, the people you thought would care, the people you thought would have compassion, they're just cold and silent and loveless and distant. When you're hurting, when you're grieving, when you're struggling, when someone reaches out with a compassionate heart rather than with a cold and dead cane offering, those things are super meaningful to you. Those are the types of things that deeply work the bonds of love into relationships. Those are the types of things that demonstrate the gospel has truly taken hold of your heart and it can't be overstated how important verbal, affectionate, and even appropriate physical expressions of compassion. Uh, It it can't be overstated how important those things are in the church. Think about like funeral speeches or, you know, maybe it's someone's 50th wedding anniversary and somebody starts to talk about somebody. What are some of the common things here? Man, I was in like the hardest place in my life. And you know what? So-and-so was there for me. So-and-so went through that with me. That's living in compassion. And when you live in compassion, sometimes it makes a mark on people that they remember for 80 years. Now, I've never heard you guys say this, but I have been around enough Christian circles that I have seen Satan raise the suggestion that someone's lack of compassion is justified because it's just not their personality. I want to challenge that evil demonic thought 
by asking you to show me in this text where the things we are called to live into here, including significant demonstrations of compassion, show me where they're confined to a certain personality type. Show me in the text. It's not there. In fact, in verse 11, Paul talks about like every kind of believer from every single walk of life. And then he tells us this is how they're all supposed to be, verses 12 through 17. Now, our personality types are not going to express compassion the same way, but that doesn't mean that every single Christian is, is not called to be compassionate. We all are. And justifying a lack of compassion by claiming to not have the right personality type, if you're stuck in that, I'm, trying, I'm not trying to beat you up, I'm trying to help you, but that's a satanic lie to keep you cold. Don't believe it. Don't go there. Everything in this text is expected of every believer. So here's the first call to compassion. And church membership, church membership is going to be a great opportunity for you to display compassion to real people who have real problems, who go through real things, and who endure things that are hard. And church membership puts names and faces to the ones that we are supposed to, who are supposed to be the priority of, of our lives, that we are to be the most compassionate towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not exclusive to that, but that is our primary emphasis. Church membership gives you the opportunity to display your compassion and to receive compassion from others. And... Conversely, church membership may unfortunately also be the tool God uses to show just how cold and hard you have become, how far you have fallen, and how far you have drifted from love. People might think they're very compassionate until there's opportunities to show lots of compassion and they don't do it. We can experience that in the church. So, if compassion uh, does not reside in us, we have a problem. Because compassion is essential. Because it was God's compassion towards you and me as dead sinners that motivated Him to send Christ to die for the sins of this cursed world. John 3.16 And so, if compassion doesn't reside within us, then we need to revisit the compassion God has shown us in Christ. So, there's our first virtue uh, from verse 12. Paul also tells us in verse 12 that we are to put on not only compassionate hearts, but to put on kindness. To be kind is to so interact with people in such a way that you demonstrate a sweet spirit, a spirit that's joyful in God, a spirit that is glad to see the person, a spirit that's glad to talk to the person, a spirit that's glad to be around the person and help the person that you're interacting with. That's a kind spirit. And it's important for this to be in the church because the world is not kind. The world is cold, and it's cruel, and it's dangerous, and it's deadly. Sometimes it is very difficult to find one person who will be nice to you. You ever had that kind of day where the, the, the clerks are rude, or if you're a worker, the customers are rude, the co-workers are rude, uh, people you see driving on the road are rude, and sometimes you start to feel so isolated by the coldness and just mean-spiritedness of what we encounter that you get to the end of the day and just like, man, can somebody just be nice to me? Kindness is a powerful display of love. And kindness has a way of lifting down uh, I'm sorry, lifting down. <laughs> Kindness has a way of lifting downtrodden people out of their despair. Kindness has a way of giving hope to people who feel hopeless. I think kindness can even have a way to prevent suicides or uh, killing sprees. And if you want to stand out for Christ in this cruel world, be kind to someone. And we are especially to be kind to our brothers and sisters in the Lord. We're not to give each other the cold shoulder and ignore each other and be aloof and distant from each other. Instead, authentic kindness is to mark our interactions. If we can't show kindness to our brothers and sisters in Christ, how are we going to be kind to our enemies? And so we serve a kind God. 
He's not mad about having to save us. He doesn't hold grudges over our repentant sin. He doesn't ignore us. He doesn't avoid us. He doesn't explode on us. He doesn't play passive-aggressive games where He acts like your best friend one minute and then won't even look at you the next. Instead, God is kind. God is loving. He's glad to be in a relationship with you. Zephaniah 3.17, He sings over you. Jeremiah 32, He rejoices to do good to you with all of His heart and soul. That sounds like a kind God to me. And so when you cast your sins on God and you return to the Lord, no matter what you're going, what's going on with you as a believer, listen, He's forgiving, He's gracious, and He's merciful, and He wants you to be confident that He's going to be merciful to you and gracious and kind to you. He wants you to have confidence that He will do that to you when you come to Him in your sins. Hebrews 4, verse 14 through 16. And so it is totally wrong of us to know that we've been chosen by God for salvation from the depth of His kind heart. And it is wrong for us to know Christ died for us because He's kind and then turn around and refuse to be kind to other people, especially the saints. Nothing could be more hypocritical than that. And so as members of the church who know each other, we have to, it, I think it's important for us to put on, put on kindness. How, how, how do you do that? I think meditate on ways to show kindness to each other. If you know someone, if you know what they like, if you know what excites them, if you know how they struggle, uh, and you have the opportunity to step into their lives and do very specific acts of kindness towards them to show your love, man, that is a powerful thing. Maybe it's giving someone a specific gift or taking them to do something or helping with an errand or sending a handwritten note because you know that person doesn't like email and you're just thoughtful about that because you love it. Here's a handwritten note to uh, encourage you or, or uh, you know, who knows, maybe it's just giving them a hug or speaking encouraging words or whatever. But listen, God gives us creativity. And part of the reason for that is so when the Spirit fills a creative person, they can find many creative ways to show kindness to others, especially those who are in their own church. Now Paul also tells us here in verse 12 that we're to put on humility and meekness. Put these things on. We're not to be arrogant towards each other. We're not to act like we're too good for anyone. We're not to belittle people. We're not to refuse to associate with those whom we perceive to be beneath us. Romans 12, 16. And we're not to make people feel stupid. Instead, we should approach others feeling privileged to have the opportunity to interact with them. We should feel like we are the ones who are the beneficiary of the interactions. You ever gone to interact with somebody you feel like, well, man, I'm just going to bless this person. Oh, i got to make time for this. Unfortunately, my vile heart has felt that way before. And God has really helped me this week with thinking about, Reggie, it doesn't matter who you're interacting with. You are the one who is the most blessed in that interaction. That was a convicting thought to me. And I'm like, thank you. You gave me something, Lord, to help me put on every time I go interact with every time that I go interact with somebody. Listen, you and me, we deserve to be in hell. So if anything is happening to you that's not hell, you're doing better than you deserve. And so if all we deserve before God is hell, and if the only reason we are Christians is because God chose us apart from anything in us that will praise His grace, and if Jesus Christ died and paid the penalty for our sins and if my sin is so bad that the only way I could be saved was for the Son of God to be murdered and if my sin is so bad that I, I can only receive salvation through faith and the moment I try to add anything to it I ruin the whole thing if that's how bad I am who am I to be boastful towards anyone? If I'm so lost and dead to God that I would never choose God, but I depend on my own faith, depends on God first choosing me, how can we possibly have arrogance towards anybody? If these things don't humble us, 
then nothing will. There's not a greater humbling reality than how verse 12 began. Chosen ones. Holy and blameless. And if you understand what's behind that, that's the most humbling thing there is. And so, <clears throat> studying or striving for humility, uh, the thing that helps with that greatly, according to the Spirit's divine wisdom, is remembering that you're chosen for salvation and that your holiness is rooted in the cross of Christ and Him cleaning you. At the end of verse 12, we see something else that we're to put on. Paul says that we're to put on patience. And then verse 13 tells us what the patience is to look like by saying this patience expresses itself in bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And so in the body, we are to be patient with each other. This means that the very fact that you're called to be patient tells you you're going to want something to happen that's not happening as quickly as you want it to. In a community where we all fall short, in a community where none of us have arrived, in a community where we are all progressively being changed by God, there will inevitably be times where we offend each other, where we get on each other's nerves, where we grind on each other, where we disappoint each other, where we anger each other, and where we sin against each other. If you obey God by being a meaningful, committed member of a church, guarantee you, this will happen to you. And fortunately, when it does happen, God has gone before us in Colossians 3 and commanded us about what we're to do here. There's something He tells us to put on. And what we're to put on in these, as we live out life in the body is we put on patience. Meaning, we're not going to just destroy people while we wait on God to change them. We put on forbearance, meaning we're going to bear with each other, we're going to hang in there with each other, we're going to persevere with each other, and we're not going to give up on each other. And when there is sin, we're going to forgive each other, just as God in Christ forgave us. Now what Paul's telling us here in these verses, it doesn't mean that we never correct each other. We know that because Paul's going to tell us to admonish each other later in verse 16. What it means is that as someone is growing, as someone is sinning, as someone's repenting and pressing on, we're to continue to bear with that. We're to continue to fellowship with that person and love that person and encourage them to continue to follow Christ. We don't just remove ourselves from the lives of people who are difficult. Though somebody might have weird quirks or habits like my family likes to tease me when I go to the movie theater and people crunch their popcorn like super loud. You ever hear that? This is, this drives me nuts. Somebody gets their popcorn and it's like, and it's like they're like trying to echo it through the, through the room. That drives me nuts. And so when we go to the movie theater, I actually take earplugs with me because if you put the earplugs on, you don't hear the over and over again, but you can still hear the movie. See, that's a petty thing. It's a stupid thing. But it drives me nuts. And no one's doing anything wrong. And I'm sitting here looking, you know, I went to the movie with Noel the other night and this dude was just destroying his popcorn. And then the worst thing ever happened. He gets to the end of his popcorn. I'm like, oh, praise God, I'm delivered. And you know what happens? You guessed it. He got a refill. (laughs) Then I'm just like, no, God. What is happening? That's a stupid thing. Eating it, crying, being loud with your popcorn shouldn't bother me. It drives me nuts. And sometimes stupid things like that in the body get us so worked up. So just... Uh, we don't even want to be around each other over stupid, petty things like this. And the Word of God says, man, you need to bear with people. You need to, okay, so this person doesn't tie their shoes the way you would. Bear with them. This person doesn't do this certain thing the way you would. Bear with them. This person's immature about this. Okay, bear with them. That's what the Word of God tells us to do. Put on patience. 
Put on forbearance. And I am so convicted every time I go to the movies. Because I sit there and I'm like, Lord, I have just got so far to go that this drives me nuts. I don't even know what happened last 10 minutes of the movie because all I heard was the popcorn. I'm so distracted by this. And so, anyways, people have immaturities. People have things that grind on us. People will sin against us. People will slight us. People will do these things. And, and it is our com- we are commanded here to bear with this stuff. Man, to love these people. These are, these are just the, the silly, petty things. They're not to destroy our love for other people. And in fact, not only are people going to do weird things like that, people are going to do actual sins against us too. And this text tells us that we're to forgive as God in Christ forgave us. And Jesus is super clear in Matthew 18.35. If we're not willing to forgive our brothers and sisters when they sin against us, we're going to hell. Matthew 18.35. Have meaningful involvement in a church and you will soon find out if you are a forgiving person or if you are petty and bitter. So many people get sinned against and they can't forgive. And so if... People do things that grind on us by some non-sinful thing, by like, like eating popcorn the wrong way, or if people actually sin against us and we're not willing to forgive and bear with people. 2 Peter 1 tells us we're so nearsighted and blind that we've forgotten the gospel. And if we don't repent, you should not have assurance of salvation. Forbearance, kindness, meekness, humility, repentance, forgiveness, they are the power that makes life in the Christian community thrive. And without these things, every local congregation will die. Now listen, this doesn't mean that there are not extreme cases where we have to discipline unrepentant members out. We just covered that a few weeks ago. Church discipline's a different category. It's not what's being addressed here. We saw this a few weeks ago that the church is commanded to discipline out unrepentant members and we're to obey that too. We can't put this text over scenarios that require church discipline and and fail to be obedient to church discipline text. This is talking about the norm of the Christian life in the church. It's this, that's what's being addressed here in Colossians. And yeah, church discipline things are rare. But the norm in the Christian life is this. We bear with each other. We forgive each other. We, 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 we show compassion to each other. Listen, Christ died for our sins. He died for all of them. Including times of great hypocrisy in your life. No, he died for all the sins you committed prior to coming to him, all the sins you committed after becoming a believer, all the ones that you're going to continue to commit, all the ones you know about, all the ones you don't know about. He died for all of them. And you and I have sinned more against God than anyone will ever sin against us. And if we can't forgive our own brothers and sisters who sin against us, then neither will we be forgiven. And at the same time, when we consistently model God's forgiveness to each other, we're not only a faithful witness of what the love of God is like to the world, but we help each other become more confident in the forgiving love of God. There's been times where I sinned against Julie, and she was so quick to forgive me that, you know, when you're sinning and and you feel bad, you're kind of hiding from God because you just feel like He's mad at you. At least this happens to me. And you have a hard time drawing near because you're just like, man, He's just... He's got to be ready to puke me out of his mouth. Sometimes it's the same I'll sin against Julie. It'll make me feel that way against God. And I'll try to repent to God. And then I turn around and repent to Julie. And she's so gracious and forgiving. And I'm like, wait a second. God is much more forgiving and gracious than Julie. So if she just forgave me, then I know I, and that helps me to have great faith that God has forgiven me too. And so in a culture of forgiveness and kindness and forbearance. We help each other know the love of God. And these things play out powerfully in church membership. Now in verse 14, Paul continues his flow by saying, Above all these, put on love, which binds them, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. I believe what Paul intends to communicate here. Uh, what he means by love is what I call the spirit of love. 
Love is an action for sure. And part of the actions that express love have already been described in the previous verses in this passage. In fact, if you want to look at this passage in Colossians 3 and compare it to 1 Corinthians 13's definition of love, there are strong parallels in it. We know love is an action. However, love is also a spirit and an attitude. And we know this because Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13.3 that we can give away all our possessions and surrender our lives for someone and still lack love. Well, if love is just an action, then how can Paul say that in 1 Corinthians 13? Love is an action, but it's more than an action. It's also a heart and it's an attitude. And so there is a spirit to love. There's an attitude to love. So in our text, I believe Paul is emphasizing that love binds all these things together in perfect harmony. But when Paul says that, he's telling us that love as an attitude, it's supposed to permeate our compassion. It fills our kindness. It fills our humility and our patience and our forbearance and our forgiveness. We're not to just have cold and dead works that counterfeit. We're not to have counterfeit compassion. Hey man, heard about this thing. How you doing? Okay, you good, right? You good? good? Alright, cool. That's not loving compassion. That's garbage compassion. <laughs> when we're called to forbear with one another. Oh, yeah. Uh, you just go off in your head for 10 minutes about why you can't stand the person. Well, I guess I've got to forbear. Hey. And we love it. That is demonic forbearance. That's not real forbearance. So love binds everything we looked at. In, it binds it together in perfect harmony. Loving compassion that is really engaged. Loving humility that really feels humble and is humble. Loving kindness that's glad to be kind, that wants to benefit the other person. Loving forgiveness that doesn't forgive and then is mad that they has to forgive, but love that wants to forgive. Love binds all these things together. And so when these virtues are lived out by us and it's done in love, there becomes a spiritual atmosphere. that is full of the love of God, full of the love of His people. There's an attitude of love and a demeanor of love and a presence of love. And it's very sweet. And even though you may not be able to concretely define it, you know it when you see it. And it's very powerful. In fact, love is so powerful, Jesus said to the disciples of John 13, 34 through 35, that our love for each other is what's going to be the testimony to the world that we're His disciples. So why is church membership so important? It's in church membership where we live out this love together. It's not just about evangelism. I love evangelism. You guys know me. I love evangelism. But evangelism divorced from church membership is not, is not biblical. In the church, one of the powerful evangelistic powers is the love the church has for each other. Verse 15 tells us that when these characteristics of the new man, when they're intentionally put on, when they're all bound together in love, then it flows, we, we get the resulting uh, fruit of verse 15. It says, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Since peace is such a blessing. And through the gospel, God has given us peace with Himself. Romans 5.1 Christ Himself has perfect peace. When Christ was living on the earth, He had many temptations and trials and hardships. And through it all, He trusted the Father. He overcame the world. And he had, as He did so, He had deep peace welling within Him because He knew who He was. He knew what He was going to accomplish. He knew what His destiny was. And He was certain nothing could stop it. So He didn't let hard things undo Him. And Jesus says, my peace I leave to you. I, I, I give you my peace. In this world you have trouble, but I, I'm going to give you my peace. He extends this peace to His followers. And so when we are secure in God's love for us, when we're secure in our identity, for me, for, uh, our identity in Him, excuse me, when we are secure in our eternal destiny, and as we put on the characteristics of the new man that are bound in love, Christ's peace will what? Rule in our hearts. 
and we can extend peace to each other. We can forgive each other because we're people of peace. We can labor to live in a community of genuine peace. Peace rules in our heart as believers. And when this peace rules in our heart, what Paul says about us is true in verse 15. We are one body. The church isn't made up of a bunch of warring factions. Instead, because we forgive and forbear and peace marks us and lives in us, we are one body, one body of peace. In light of all that God is for us in Christ, in light of the blessed community of the new man that we are now a part of, Paul tells us at the end of verse 15, he says, be thankful. He tells us this because there's a great power in gratitude. And when we're full of thanksgiving and we're not full of complaining, when we're aware of how good God is, and and when we're aware of also, despite its shortcomings, how sweet it is to be part of the church, and when we realize that we're God's children and members of His church because of His saving grace and the work of Christ, when those things are really, when we're mindful of those things, we are thankful. And when we're a thankful people, we don't feel slighted by every petty thing. We don't feel entitled to be treated as kings wherever we go. We don't feel sorry for ourselves when we're thankful. Instead, there's a holy perseverance in the Christian life and with the people of God. There's a strong spirit-created graciousness and joy and peace within us and it comes from a grateful heart. When our eyes are open to how blessed we truly are, many sins die. Much complaining stops. Strife ceases. Peace prevails because we are thankful. And there's just a tremendous amount of good and a tremendous amount of power that comes from a heart that is uh, thankful and filled with gratitude. I don't know about you guys, I love being around grateful people. I love it and I hate it. I hate it because it convicts me big time. And I love it because I'm like, man, I want to be be like that. um, Thanksgiving has tremendous power. So, okay. I know, I'm sorry. I know we're late. I'm going to condense all this and go real fast. Let's look at the uh, last verse, verse 16. uh, Verse 16 says, And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So the last thing to draw out here that we're to put on is letting the Word of God dwell in us richly. As believers, to put on that reality, man, you are going to plan your life and discipline your life to be somebody who pursues knowing the Word of God. To do, to order your life in such a way that it constantly is flowing into you so that the Word of God fills you richly and that as you interact with people, you sound like a Bible. You think the truths of God. You talk the truths of God. You even feel the truths of God. The thing that delights God's heart, man, it delights your heart. The things that grieve the Spirit, it grieves your spirit. Why? Because the Word of Christ is dwelling in you richly. And as you go living out your day, the Spirit starts bringing different passages to mind as you encounter the day. And you are then living with the mind of Christ. You are filled with the Spirit because the book the Spirit wrote lives in you in a rich way and the Spirit takes the truths He wrote and brings it to your mind on a continual basis. You speak Bible, you think Bible, you live Bible. And it says that we're to instruct each other with that in the church. Speaking the Word of God into each other's lives. And all, so, oh, hey man, check out what I saw. Bang. How many times has somebody told you, oh, God showed me this this morning in your devotions, and it was like perfect for you? And it totally edifies. It's happened to me a million times. And so, when you get a whole church full of people that are just full of the Word, and they're just boom, 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 just sharing, oh, I saw this in the Word this week, I saw this, I saw that yesterday, oh, this convicted me, this encouraged me, this comforted me, blah, 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 we're sharing those things with each other. You get a community of people filled with the Word, talking like that, man, there are some crazy spiritual synergies there. That's going to make us strong people. The Word is to dwell in us richly. 
and we're to talk it to each other and instruct each other. And the Word says here in Colossians 3.16, well, it's to admonish each other with the Word. Sometimes we're wrong. All of us are wrong about things sometimes. And we need each other to help each other see that. And the way that we do it is by showing each other in the Word of God where our thinking is on. With what kind of hearts? Exactly what we just studied in verses 12 through 15. We're going to show you this stuff from the Word of God. Instruct each other. Admonish and correct each other with the Word of God. And as we are a church who is like that, then we can definitely be confident Jesus Christ is sitting on the throne in this church. He rules through His Word. He reigns in His people's hearts as we hold those truths in our hearts and submit to those truths and obey those truths and follow those truths. Christ reigns in us through the Word of God. John 15, 7. So, that's the community God calls us to be. And of course, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop it for time's sake, but that results in singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs and results in us being dedicated to whether we eat or drink, whatever we do. In verse 17, we're going to do all of the glory of Christ. And so <clears throat> I'm going to cut that short for time's sake. But listen, let's think about everything for just, uh, just a minute. Everything that we've covered tonight in light of church membership. How do you live out the things that we looked at if you're not a member of a church? Do these things sound like they're all things that just take place in the service? They do, but they take place beyond the service. They take place as we weave our lives together. Listen, the New Testament church, man, they were together. They're involved in each other's lives. Paul says we share our very lives with you in 1 Thessalonians 2. That wasn't just to be a model of what a good pastor's like. That's to be a model of what a good Christian's like. We share our lives with each other. There's no rule of how much time are I going to hit the certain minute mark, you know, stuff like that. Listen, you know when you're doing it and you know it when you're not. <clears throat> and as we have rich, meaningful involvement in each other's lives, then we can live out the things that are described here in Colossians 3. You cannot do the things commanded of you in Colossians 3 in your basement listening to John MacArthur all day. You can't. You cannot do these things. If you say, oh man, I listened to a sermon this day. I listened to the Bible in my car. I, I listened to whatever the, the band that you like. I listened to Newsboys and this guy and that guy and all that sort of stuff. But you have no interaction with the church. You're in sin. It's not okay. It's called a sin. And it needs to be repented of. And then, listen, this is a blessing and a joy. And in America, maybe it's a little harder for us than than it is in other countries. We had some uh, family over a couple weeks ago who's uh, from India. And they were just telling us just how blown away, how different, uh, how blown away they are by how different America is. Everybody's just stay in my house and I got my own, I got my, I got my financial security, I got my insurance policies, I own my house, get off my lawn. You know, that's really, if I interact with somebody, it's purely in my terms and my agenda. They're not woven into each other's lives. And so maybe in, in our day there's some unique temptations because the American dream is to be so financially secure that you can be independent of everybody. And you know what? You just weren't created for that. You were created to be in community with God and with God's people. God is a community. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Our triune God is one. He is a community. We're made into that image. We're as image bearers. What's our mandate? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. You can't do that apart from human intimacy. Like we are made for it in every single way. And as the community of new creation, as those who have been made alive in Christ, we have to come together in church membership and have meaningful involvement in each other's lives or we simply cannot live out the things that God calls us to live out in His Word. So I wanted to go through the things in Colossians 3 for the church membership series because I felt like when you look at those things as these basic tenets in the Christian life, it becomes real obvious why you need community. Why you need the church. So anyways, um, are there any questions or uh, comments? Well, 
to quote the immortal Jim Carrey. Alrighty then. Uh, let's pray and it will be dismissed. <clears throat> Father, we thank You for um, choosing a people for salvation. You chose Israel. They were Your elect in the Old Testament. And now the uh, fulfilled Israel in Your church, it's also by election. God, we praise You for that. We thank You for choosing us individually and corporately and for making us Your children. Uh, we thank You also, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross for our sins. We didn't deserve it, but You did it because You're kind and You're gracious and You're compassionate. We thank You for that. And Lord, uh, as we looked at what your word says in Colossians 3. I'm pretty sure nobody here feels like we've arrived in any part of it. We thank you for the real fruit you've produced in it. You've really done these things uh, in our lives and we give you thanks for that. And at the same time, God, we are hungry for more of it. Um, we're uh, convicted by all of it and we want to press into it more. And so we just pray that by your spirit and by your grace, you'll work into us and make us a, a, a community that really and truly authentically puts off the old man of Colossians 3, 5 through 9 and puts on the new man of verses 12 through 17. God, we love you and we want our community to be a community of praise and of song and of holy love and of holy worship that rightly reflects Jesus Christ and builds each other up in the faith as the word dwells in us richly as we all bow to you and give praise and honor to you, the head of the church who reigns in the church through the word of God. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.